told to be careful that I'm in the microphone. How's that sound? Thank you, everybody. It's really a pleasure um, to be here. It's been an interesting day so far, and uh, I hope I'll keep your interest in the next lecture. Mine is going to be somewhat different, more international in focus, somewhat more descriptive, and I have no cartoons of rich people, so we'll have to, uh, <laughs> we'll have to fill in uh, some of that qualitative uh, nuance some other way. Okay. Um, so let me just tell you briefly what it is that I'm going to do. Uh, I laid out six questions, and I hope I'll have time to get through all of them. Some are longer and more intricate than others, but here they are. Um, it's been widely reported that since the 1980s, income inequality has increased in about two-thirds of the high-income countries. Uh, and I'm just going to run you through some descriptive so we can take a look at the question, sorting fact from fiction. Is that accurate? Has income inequality increased, and which type of income inequality, we've already heard a bit about this today, is that income inequality with regard to market income, or what we call factor income, the labor market and capital, or is it income inequality after we've accounted for public transfers and taxes? Um, second of all, we hear a lot about the hollowing out of the middle, uh, which I think is enormously interesting in both uh, rich countries and in lower income countries. It's a question that's of interest to economists, political scientists, and sociologists, um, many of whom argue that a strong middle, a large middle and a strong middle is important uh, for a well-functioning democracy and for the development of infrastructure. So I want to take a look at that because some of the descriptive findings um, are somewhat um, unexpected. Uh, then I'm going to ask very briefly what do the high-income countries look like when we step back a bit and place them in the context of upper middle income countries. I'm using the term affluent to refer mostly uh, to high income and upper middle using the, the classic absolute cutoffs that the international organizations use. Um, and then I'm going to talk very briefly about wealth. Wealth data are harder to come by. Uh, wealth methodological standards are more recently developed. I think the theory is still some years behind uh, in terms of measurement, what it is in the income field. But to show you, looking, giving you a quick preview, that wealth inequality um, at the micro level uh, is greater than income inequality, and the two tend to be correlated across households within countries. So that's an important part of the, of the story of economic inequality that we're really only beginning to understand. I'm going to say a little bit about the causes of rising inequality. David has covered that um, in a lot of detail, and then close uh, with the question of why do we care. I suppose we might open with why do we care, but I'm going to assume that most of you care, and then we'll look back on why it is we care a little bit later on. Okay. Um, the data that I'm going to, you've heard a little bit of reference to this already. Um, virtually, uh, no, all of the data that I'm going to show you come from an organization called LIS, known as, uh, used to be called the Luxembourg Income Study. The name was changed in 2010 to reflect the fact that it had grown essentially from a study into an institute over a period of, of several decades. Um, and it's now called LIS Cross National Data Center in Luxembourg. Uh, we, it, the main office is in Luxembourg. We have a satellite office that I run in New York. I've been working with LIS since 1989, um, and I'm very uh, intimately involved in it and, and, and its growth. Um, so the income data that I'm going to show you comes from one of the components database is known as the Luxembourg Income Study Database, and the wealth data will come from uh, a parallel database. So just a couple of sentences about that, and if, there's, if people are interested afterwards, I can give, um, I can certainly uh, answer detailed questions. Uh, what LIST does and has done since it was founded in 1983 is it gathers micro data sets that are based on households, almost exclusively on household surveys, uh, and brings them to Luxembourg. We, we convince the national statistical offices and other data providers to trust us with these precious, albeit anonymized, microdata. We bring them to Luxembourg, and we, uh, in a very laborious process, recode them into a common template so that we are re reproducing or producing the same income concepts, the same wealth concepts, labor market, household demography across countries and over time. So the primary intellectual um, value added there is this harmonization work. We spend sometimes up to 16 weeks on a data set. It's a very uh, laborious pro process. Um, and, uh, I'm, and the second thing that we do uh, is to make the data available through a remote execution system. So something like 6,000 researchers around the world have used the data uh, since we um, came into being. We now have 52 countries um, up, uh, in repeated cross-sections across 10 points in time. So there's much more to be said, but I, I'll leave it mostly at that. Once again, these are mostly based on household surveys, some of which are enhanced uh, by the data providers, not by us, um, with sections of the databases being filled in by administrative data. So these data are different from uh, the tax data that you've seen in some other presentations, and in fact, 
uh, David's first slide showed the national, so income inequality using a national income definition, which is also something completely different. That's taking the entire national pie uh, and imputing it down to the household level. So there really, there's at least three large categories, there's sort of large buckets of ways to measure income and income inequality, and we're sticking quite close to the data uh, to reported numbers coming through surveys. Uh, I'm really happy to say, just to take a moment, that um, some of you may know this, uh, I know some of you do know this, Israel has been part of a list since the very beginning. It was one of the original six countries and has been a really important part of, um, of lists as a data provider, as a funder, as an advisor. We've had over the years three uh, board members and in, in the space of, of like three decades uh, from uh, Israel, representing Israel to help us understand the data and build our ties. And all three of them are here, I'm happy to say, Leah Achtud and Daniel Gottlieb and Mary Endveld. Lots of researchers uh, in Israel use the data. I once calculated the the ratio of published papers to population of our 50 countries in Israel came out first, I'm happy to say. <laughs> and they're not all economists, too. So um, no, it was a very, really excellent use by sociologists at the University of Tel Aviv and, and Hebrew University and elsewhere. So Israel's really uh, a, a really important, intimate, and cherished uh, partner. And partly for that reason, it's, it's really a pleasure um, to be here today. OK, I'm going to give you a rather rapid fire descriptive uh, story. And um, again, we can, I'll, we'll uh, leave time for questions. For, for, I'm going to try to keep the detail to a minimum, um, but we'll have time a little bit later on. OK, so here is um, the, one of the first questions is just simply looking um, at levels. And in a moment, I'm going to show you some trends. So what you see here are a series of high income countries just this morning. Thanks to the cleverness of PowerPoint, I put a little star next to the Israel finding in each slide just so you thought you might be interested so you could see them. So first of all, this is a very common picture using data like the data that come from lists. Um, this is simply looking at income inequality using the well-known uh, Gini coefficient, which you heard mentioned a few times today already. The red bar, the longer bar, is the measure of income inequality across households, adjusted for household size, using a particular definition, which here we call before taxes and transferred transfers, we also call that factor income. It's the sum of all income from the labor market, whether that's wage labor or self-employment, as well as capital, uh, income flows from capital. And then after, uh, essentially, is after we add public and private transfers and subtract direct taxes paid by the household, which include income taxes and payroll contributions for, 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 social, contri for social programs. So that, this is a very standard before and after. Uh, one thing that we've done here is to uh, look at working age households uh, separately because if you bring the elderly in, it co complicates the story because uh, most elderly people, uh, elderly households have a very low amount of market income and live on transfers. And so the story really is, uh, is a hybrid. I don't ever recommend doing this analysis, including uh, non-working age and working age households together. But anyway, most of what you're going to see here are what we would call non-elderly households. So a few things to jump out here. Um, the, the blue then is the at the end of the day. That's the after taxes and transfers, the level of income income inequality that you generally hear about. And what do we see? A fairly well-known clustering. The more unequal countries include the Anglophone countries, uh, the US, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia. Uh, the least unequal, based on this after taxes and transfers measure, um, are the Nordic countries and the Netherlands. And this, this pattern is held um, for many decades. Uh, what you see, though, is just in terms of the ordering, the high inequality countries, uh, these Anglophone countries, are joined by Spain and by Israel. Um, so how do you read this picture? That in an accounting sense, the difference between the length of the red bar and the blue bar is the amount of redistribution that takes place through taxes and transfers. So again, it's an accounting exercise. It's a powerful little window on, uh, on the state um, intervention, but it doesn't take account of any kind of behavioral responses, right? It's just literally the difference uh, in this fictive distribution, the market income distribution, and the actual one that are reported by households. So just to give you a sense of how to read this, the United States has the highest level of income inequality in this, I'm going to call this disposable household income. It's a little bit, uh, rolls off the tongue better than post-tax and transfer. But that's the standard measure in the international literature, disposable household income. The Gini in the US is 0.38. Um, before taking account of taxes and transfers, it's 0.47. So we say the state is removing nine percentage points of inequality, or nine Gini points of inequality. Um, Israel, interestingly enough, is very the same level of um, of inequality removal, uh, but from 0.43 to 0.34. So something interesting, and I'm going to come back to this. You've all heard this now twice already. I had the same picture. Uh, we update the data in Luxembourg every three years. So we, the data come in in waves 
essentially 2000, 2004, 2007, 2010, 2013, now we're working on 2016. Um, up until recently, I had this exact same slide for 2010, uh, and Israel was at the top, the most unequal in terms of disposable household income, but it has moved down in rank uh, as the absolute level of income inequality has fallen since 2010, which we'll come back to. Um, let me just explain one little thing I realized in the notation here. Um, be, I'm mixing time points simply because I, we're right in the middle of still finishing the, the waves from 2013 and 16. So these numbers are from a combination of years between 2012 and 2016. Unfortunately, the data from Ireland, which I'll come back to as a rather remarkable story, uh, is from one data point earlier. Okay, so this is a very common picture. Um, the second picture here, whoops, I'm not going down. Something's happening. There it goes. Oh, oops. <laughs> okay. Um, this this picture is exactly the same numbers from the prior picture, just uh, just reorganized in order to point to the fact that this type of analysis is helpful for thinking about policy analysis. It has a diagnostic and prescriptive component. So this is exactly the same picture you saw before, except now on the horizontal axis is the level of inequality before taxes and transfers. So here it says factor income. So that's basically market income inequality. And on the vertical axis, what you see there is the difference in the length of the two bars. So in other words, the amount of redistribution. So it just helps you to see that, in a, you know, put very simply, that, that countries can get to uh, the same level of disposable income inequality through different routes, through either having low market income inequality, extensive redistribution, or both, or any combination of those. So just to take a look there again, you can see the U.S. and Israel um, have, a, uh, the U.S. has relatively higher um, level of market income inequality, um, and then the level of redistribution is actually not all that different. So the income inequality in Israel is ending up at a lower level, mostly because of the lower level of market income inequality. Look at the Irish case. Uh, where the Gini coefficient from before and after goes to 0.53 down to 0.29. So we see there a case where, where with that, if you didn't disaggregate into this before and after, you'd be missing a really crucial part of the story here, okay? Um, so we, as we often note, I'd use the slide in my public policy classes in the United States if, uh, using sort of anthropomorphic language, if the United States wanted to lower income inequality in disposable income, uh, it could either engage in policy measures that would move the U.S. to the left or up, or both. So in other words, it could reduce market income inequality through what is now often called pre-distributive pre measures, raising the minimum wage, strengthening collective agreements. Um, there are various techniques and, or various policy instruments available for, for reducing wage inequality, uh, or it could leave essentially the wage or market inequality at the household level as it is and have an, uh, increase the amount of redistribution that, that takes place through tax and transfers. The Irish case is quite remarkable here. The high level of market income inequality, uh, this is 2010, but the number is almost exactly the same. My Irish colleagues just took a look at this for me this week because I was also just wondering if this was a, uh, the result of, of the crisis period. It actually isn't. So in 2016, the market income inequality in Ireland fell from 5.3 0.53 to 0.49, something in, unusual. It's really the demography of, of worklessness, uh, and it happens to be in Ireland that household has the highest ratio in all of the OECD countries of households where the whole household is workless. And on the other hand, it has a very high ratio, high share of households with three earners. So it's a very bifurcated demographic structure. So the market income inequality is somewhat unusual. The high level of redistribution is much less mysterious. It's an extremely targeted, means-tested uh, income transfer system and a very uh, progressive tax system. So these kinds of pictures help us, uh, you know, to take it as a window, provides a window into policy analysis. Okay, so what happened over time? Um, here, using this same distinction, um, the red is the household disposable income and the blue is the market income. Um, and this has changed between 1985 and roughly the current period. And what we see here is a mix, essentially. A mix, some are up, some are fairly flat, some are down, sometimes they diverge. And actually, Israel is an unusual story here, where between these two points in time, market income fell slightly, but, but uh, disposable income actually rose, which I think is related, would be explained by the weakening in the redistribution that was shown in one of the earlier slides. So these things com combine in all kinds of complicated ways. Um, what you, it, this, this is only a, um, 
I think I have only 14 countries in this slide, but if you look at the OECD numbers for 36 countries, you'll find almost exactly the same story of income inequality rising post-tax and transfer in about two-thirds of countries, and in the other third, either flat or falling. Um, a couple of things just to note about that, that the rise, the pattern in the rise when you're looking at the Gini is fairly standard, or it's fairly uh, consistent, but the magnitude is not enormous. On average, it was two to three Gini points, which is usually viewed as both statistically significant and substantial, but not enormous. The real increase in income inequality comes in a measure that we're not using here, which is the concentration uh, at the top, which I'll come back to. Um, I think one thing to come that should come out of this story is that, countries, is that countries vary. There is no one universal pattern, which is really important. Probably maybe doesn't need to be said in this audience, but in a lot of discussions, it sort of relates to some of what David talked about. We hear about rising inequality uh, as if it's you know transnational forces of globalization and technology, and it's inexorable, and it's universal, and it's everywhere. And it's just simply not the case. Um, in fact, in the same years, between 1985 and 2010, while in the OECD countries, uh, income inequality rose in about two-thirds of the countries, it fell in nearly every Latin American country. Um, that st has stagnated now in 17 of 18 Latin American countries, mostly upper middle income. Uh, it fell, and the story of its decline is somewhat like the story of the recent decline in Israel. Um, so this morning, I have to say, I realized that this picture was bothering me because I know uh, anytime you pick two points in time, of course, you always do it at your peril as a bit of a fool's errand, because I knew that something in Israel happened that was a little bit more complicated. So thank goodness for Excel, I made this picture this morning, um, uh, which ironically I thought maybe would surprise some of you, but I think it's the third time you've seen it now. It's only the middle of the day. Um, but you do see here Still that surprising. it's still surprising. Okay, good. Um, you do see something extremely unusual. This is not a pattern that we're seeing in very many of the rich countries. So, of course, the story that I told you of rising inequality from 1985, about over here, until the end is, is, is true. But it was certainly, a, if my end point um, had been earlier, which in fact it was in an earlier version of this PowerPoint, uh, the, the increase was, was much darker. And this downturn, which I think we've talked about already, and I'm sure many here can explain better than I, but it does seem to be largely explained by uh, rising labor supply among some marginalized groups of workers, including women, including uh, religious men, including. Now, what's from, from what Avi told me, I learned this at dinner last night. Um, from what Avi told me, though, the increase in the labor supply actually started earlier than the downturn in inequality, but the net effect doesn't show up until later. And I think there's must be, I'm sure there's a story about what's happening, the pattern of redistribution as well. So this is quite, quite remarkable and one of the great values of looking both across countries and over time and also uh, beware using two points in time, which I was doing just so I don't drown you in too many pictures. Okay, let's talk about the middle. Um, something else, it's an area of research that I'm really fascinated by. I edited a book on income inequality um, some years ago uh, with my colleague Marcus Yanti, a, a Finnish economist. Um, 17 chapters on income inequality, all based on various aspects of the list data. And we asked our colleagues, uh, a lot of us had been working on poverty and inequality, and in the list literature for many years, those two were, were nearly um, inseparable. Most, f for one reason, is that we mostly, almost all use relative measures of poverty in lists, and in Europe, Eurostat, and OECD, we typically measure poverty in a relative framework, something like uh, a, poor, uh, a person is poor, a household is poor, if the household size adjusted income is less than 50% of the national median, or in some cases, 60%. So it is a measure of inequality in the lower half, and so we tend to look at poverty and inequality together. And then after 2010, for a variety of reasons, and other researchers and new data, there was this enormous emphasis from Piketty and coming the Paris School of Economics, very different way of measuring inequality, but the focus on the top, uh, and there was tremendous uh, interest, and there still is, on the rising top, and we felt noted that the literature in the middle was really kind of missing. So when people talked about the weakening of the middle, uh, what did that mean? It was getting smaller, it was getting weaker, what did that, it, was getting, it was getting smaller or poorer. So as a quick aside, I'm trying to think of any of the authors who are in the room here. Um, no, we asked our 17 authors each to include a section. Some of the papers were on wealth, some were on income, some were women and work, some were on politics. We asked everybody to include some analysis of the middle, and in the 17 chapters, they came back with 25 different definitions of the middle class. Um, <laughs> and uh, our publisher, Stanford University Press, wasn't very uh, impressed with that. So we did sort of get them down to about 10. But we had done it, we did it purposefully so that people could have flexibility. And then, of course, what we realized, and it's something now, a literature I've read quite a bit in, 
Um, it's re there's really very little standardization in this discussion. So uh, some people measure the middle class. First of all, almost everybody in our world uses some, uses some portion of the income distribution, obviously for measurement and data reasons. Uh, sociologists tend to use a more multidimensional notion, which would include occupation, education, maybe household structure. But in the world of the kind of data that we have in the world we were doing, almost everybody uses the income distribution. Several people used a definition of something like the middle 60. We saw the middle 50, we saw the middle 40. That's quite common. Obviously, if you look at, if you use that definition over time, the size of the middle class can't change. Um, but its its share of the total income pie can change. Its, me, it's it, median income can change. But the other method that was used, uh, which we see a lot in the literature, is m making a band around the median, like 75 to 200 percent. But we also saw 50 to 300. We saw all kinds of things. Also, as a quick aside, we had one chapter from South Africa and one from India. Um, and they asked us, what do we want them to use? And we were saying things like, well, a lot of the researchers are using the middle 60 and they both came back and said that is completely absurd in India and South Africa. That makes no sense at all because a huge share of the middle class are destitute in, if you use that measure. So it's a really fascinating literature, I have to say. OECD just came out with a big report um, and have come up with even, have moved it up in the distribution um, and so forth. Okay, all that's to say, just to show you a couple of things. Um, in this particular slide, I just was showing uh, I took one particular approach here, and this is to ask the question about what happened in that same three-decade period that I'm focusing on. And by the way, I should have said that. The early 1980s is widely understood as sort of a crucial inflection point uh, of the beginning of, of the rising inequality that we saw in so many rich countries. So what do we see here um, in this same group of countries that I've shown you? These are all high high-income countries, I hope you can read that. Uh, the size of the middle class in Ireland grew, in Denmark a very small growth, in Switzerland a small decline, and the rest of them modest declines to, to, to less modest. Um, and Israel is one that stands out that the size of the middle class fell by nine percentage points, and that's on a base of about 75% using this definition. So the definition is households have income between half and twice the median, half being a very common measure uh, of poverty, and then twice the median uh, some could argue is the floor under on, on affluence. Um, so that's what happened. So Israel had a quite a large change. Luxembourg had an even larger change. So again, nine percentage point loss on about 75%. Now, where did they go in a cross-sectional sense? Did they go up or did they go down? What do you all think in Israel? Did they go up or did they go down? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, we can ask. My answer was yes. <laughs> Your answer is yes. Aha. Uh, uh -huh. Well, what you can see here. Um, is that in Israel, in fact, most of them went down. But what you do see, first of all, a few things to say here, is you see a real diversity of patterns here. You see that the middle class, so this question is simply asking what happens to the size of the middle class. It fell uh, in, in, in most of these countries. Um, but did, they, did, the, did the decrease, uh, is it, does it correspond to an increase in the group below or the group above? And again, you do see quite a diversity. Now in Israel, what you see here, those nine percentage points, the nine points of households that moved out of the middle class, two went up and seven went down. Two percentage points went up and seven went down. So that was a story of a shrinking middle class with mostly downward movement. Now here's another case. If you look at Poland, for example, you see the reverse. Um, so the negative on the, on the left-hand side tells you the bottom fell, the top grew, and the entire increase uh, in the size of the middle class, uh, sorry, the entire decrease in the size of the middle class went, is, is explained by upward movement. Okay, so I show this to my students and they say, that's great, that's totally great. The middle class shrank because everybody got richer and fewer people are poor, isn't that good news? Well, that's a really interesting question, some of which I'll leave, leave with you. Uh, I would argue otherwise, obviously with a definition like this, you could have a middle class whose size becomes zero. The entire population could be, right, using these, this method could be below uh, half of the median or above twice the median, and what, what would it will look like uh, with zero middle class? Um, sociologists and political scientists would argue uh, not too good. Um, and I think that, you know, there, obviously there are concerns about the development of neighborhoods, of communities. Uh, there's a big literature on the strength of the middle class and the functioning of democracy. And there's a, one literature that I have to say I find enormously interesting that a lot of the work is anecdotal, but I think it's really important just as a um, a digression to mention the work of Robert Frank um, called Falling Behind, uh, Falling Behind How Rising Inequality Harms the Middle Class. Um, one of the stories that he tells, and I'm now seeing in, in empirical work in other settings, is the following story, is that uh, across um, geographies in places that are, um, if you control for income, in places that are more unequal, you see less investment in infrastructure. 
uh, lesson because of the partly because right very well to do people can sort of exit the public grid uh, and provide their own services privately which doesn't serve those who remain on the public grid a couple of examples that are given uh, actually one example I find in New York City is quite remarkable in the US 10% of children K through 12 are in private schools uh, in New York City that's 20% but in the richest district on the Upper East Side of Manhattan it's almost 80% so one can only imagine what that does to the public investment in the tiny sector that remains for the children of the middle class. So in any case, that's a kind of an anecdote. But there are many versions of that. I have to say, I had a student who did a dissertation looking across the states of Brazil with all kinds of controls and found mm -hmm. that in the states of Brazil that were more unequal, there was much less investment in climate change mitigation because the well-to-do, if they're possible, move up the hill and have a private generator. Um, and in the cases where that's less common, you see sea walls and so forth. So this notion about, a, a, um, a, about the declining middle class being connected to declining infrastructure investment, I think is one that needs more work and is very interesting. Now, um, this picture is a little bit ugly, and um, it's ugly because it's a still, essentially, of what was an interactive chart that was in the New York Times. So uh, we did lists, we did a big piece for the New York Times upshot when they, uh, when they opened. And so this is just a still, but I want to tell you what this is anyway. And the real one, which I wasn't clever enough to do in a PowerPoint, you run a cursor over and can see all the country names and numbers. But basically these are the same countries I just showed you. So what is this showing that same 30 year period? Um, and it's the bottom, um, uh, the bottom, basically the bottom 10, the 25th percentile, the, the middle, the 75th, and the 90th. And this is showing real income in country, in a PPP, you know, country, international dollars are PPP adjusted. Um, and so this is, a, a, this is the kind of picture that allows you to ask the question that almost everybody is asking today, is growth inclusive, is prosperity shared? Um, and so just a couple of things to point to. The reason that I put it here, though, was to show you that in almost all these cases when the size of the middle class was shrinking, median income was actually rising. So just to remind people to be very careful conceptually when you talk about the collapse of the middle class, because both of those can happen. It can shrink in size. And in fact, I think it's sort of a selection story. If it shrinks in size because people move down, then, the, then it does seem that the, however you measure the income in the group that remains uh, goes up. But of course, what you see here, the US is in red. There are about four different stories in this picture here. But basically, what we see is growth rates, right? They went up as you go up through the income distribution. And again, these are repeated cross sections. So these are not the same. We're not talking about the same households, but we're talking about the same points in the income distribution. The other thing you see that's quite interesting, which surprises some Americans, although not, not me, actually, is that the red, note, note the red being in the middle of the pack. Um, at the bottom, just below the top, in the middle, and at the top. So in other words, in these real dollars, in international dollars, the American poor are actually poorer than their counterparts abroad, and the American rich are richer than their counterparts abroad in terms of absolute income levels. So we hear this a lot in the US, that we have very high inequality, um, but the trade-off is that we have higher income, um, but that's, that, that is, in most cases, that's true at the middle, but it isn't true at the bottom, and that's important to recognize, especially because uh, children in the U.S. Uh, are piled up in these households at the bottom, and the supportive services that mitigate uh, the consequences of poverty are much less. Okay, um, just to move on, I'm mindful of the time. I just wanted to remind everybody, again, what I think we know um, is I've been mostly looking at high-income countries. I should add that when lists came together, we were six countries. Uh, I came to work for LIS in 1989, we were 15 countries, and now we're over 52, and fairly soon we'll, I think we're gonna be reach over 60 because we've been working very hard to bring in middle income countries. That was a change that we put in place about 15 years ago. But just to remind you, this is exactly the same as the first picture, um, but with several more countries added, almost all upper, mid upper middle and one or two are lower middle. And what you see here, of course, is although we know the story of high inequality in the OECD countries and the affluent countries, inequality is higher in many, many, any other cases. So here, uh, the US is where it was before now, somewhat above, uh, as you can see, there's Israel, um, and then Spain, Lithuania has now snuck in um, the US, and then the more unequal countries are the Gua uh, Latin American countries of Guatemala, uh, Peru, Colombia, Panama, Brazil, not surprisingly, also South Africa, and also China. So Latin America, interesting, sort of a, an analog to the Israeli story that was just mentioned that although Latin American inequality fell precipitously, it remains extremely high uh, relative to these other um, countries. The size of the middle, we see the same story. Uh, and here we see the, uh, the, the light blue would be what we would call poor, 50% of the median, the pink is the middle, 
uh, and the darker blue is the affluent. So just again, I mean, it's just another measure, but it, we see the same as that these middle classes uh, are squeezed, especially in the poorer and the more unequal countries uh, that are middle income. Okay, something else to remind you, um, really going quickly through um, a fair amount of descriptive information here, but something else to remind you is that most of the work that we've done on inequality, pretty much everything that I've shown you, actually everything that I've shown you except for the, the one about inclusive growth has been focused on relative measures, whether we're talking about the share of income held by the top one or the top 10 or the Gini coefficient or the 90-10. These are relative measures, which is what the international literature usually relies upon because it helps us uh, to make sense across countries. But then we have to remember, especially when we're combining looking at high income and middle income countries, that the income levels are really very different. And so this is just a case of showing we're back into um, price adjusted international dollars, the same countries that I've just shown you now with the middle income countries added, and this is the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile. So the most striking thing I would say is to note that the 90th percentile income using this framework, this is cash income, some near cash income. Um, I should add that, right? This doesn't include, for example, the value of health, housing, and education and things that are developed, that are provided uh, as services, but that are not necessarily monetized at the household level. Um, so this is really focusing on cash income, but a very comprehensive picture of cash income after taxes and transfers. So the 90th percentile household in South Africa has the same level of income as the 10th percentile household in Switzerland. So there's a lot of variety. And if you look at the uh, Israeli case, you did, I was just noticing this morning, kind of an in, just an interesting fact is that the upper end in Israel is about the same as several other high income countries, Denmark, Finland, the Netherlands, and Ireland, but the lower end is lower. So the inequality in Ireland is sitting in a different place in the global income distribution. Okay, um, a little bit about wealth, and then I'm mindful of the time. So um, the data that we've been using for many, many years, as I said, has been, has been coming from income surveys. So it just is worth mentioning for a moment. We don't field any surveys in Luxembourg. We simply travel around the world, really, in many cases, and virtually in others, persuading national statistical offices to trust us with their data. Uh, it's an extremely interesting process, I might add. I did it for many, many years uh, for LIS. We've had countries uh, that we negotiated with we negotiated with Japan for 21 years before we were able to get a data set. Korea was 16 years. Um, I went to the ECLAC meeting, the regional meeting um, of the United Nations for Latin America and the Caribbean some years ago, and I came back with four data sets in my purse. So you never really know. Sometimes a, a glass of wine with the right person, they hand you a CD and sign the piece of paper. Um, and then there are countries that we have pleaded and begged uh, and never succeeded, uh, one of which is New Zealand, another is Portugal, and another is Turkey. So why, why does the country not join us? Uh, several reasons. Uh, the Statistical Institute doesn't have a research culture and isn't interested. Sometimes they're strapped on staff, although that we, frankly, we never really believe that's the real reason. Um, and some of them have legal constraints, and several countries have changed the laws uh, for us. Now, mind you, we get the data. They're anonymous, and we protect them dr very much. In Luxembourg, you can't download them. They're hidden behind a firewall. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, all that's to say, though, that what has been very exciting over many years has been much more income data, much higher quality income data, much more standardized because a number of international um, commissions and groups in which we participated famously, one known as the Canberra Report, uh, has gathered statistical offices around the world. And we've seen between that and a lot of movement in the United Nations, a lot of standardization. And also, most of the income data that we get are now annual. Many of the surveys were biennial or triennial. Uh, which is why LIS has this structure historically of putting them up in cross-sectional waves. But now a lot of the data sets are annual and we are beginning to annualize the data. Uh, we just annualized Germany and we're working on others as well. Okay, so now uh, it's almost as if we're looking back in time. We are now seeing the birth of wealth surveys, of higher quality wealth surveys. Wealth is difficult to measure. Uh, there's more hidden wealth. Um, it's more complicated to sample, it's more complicated to define, the issue of pensions is very tricky. Um, but now, uh, for the first time, there is, an ex there is a data set that is um, based on surveys that were harmonized prior to the fielding of the survey, and that is, came out of the, the Eurozone. So the Eurozone ran a wealth survey in 17 countries, and we've acquired most of those, um, and then have acquired wealth from other countries. Anyway, we've spent a very long time in the last decade trying to understand wealth data uh, and harmonizing it. And uh, it's, but the, the level of um, cross-national comparability is still lagging what we have in the income world, but it's changing rapidly. Um, so anyway, just a couple of things to show. So these are, this is a smaller group of countries. Unfortunately, um, I'm happy to say 
uh, that from Israel, I was just taking a look this morning, maybe our colleagues here can help explain this. We have 11 data sets uh, from Israel on the Luxembourg side. I should say thank you to the Central Bureau of Statistics and National Insurance Institute of Israel. Uh, we don't have a wealth data set from Israel. I hope we will in the future, but we don't now. But so this is a sample of, um, of some of the findings that we have. What is jumping off this page is fairly obvious. Wealth inequality is exceeding income inequality. Uh, this is simply the Gini uh, measured the same way. And so look at the US, 0.488, which is very high in, among rich countries and income inequality. Um, and the wealth genie is 889. Uh, take a look here. Again, I'll just point you to the US. The top 20% of the income distribution holds 54% of income. The top 20% of the wealth distribution holds 91% of the wealth. You can tell these stories over, you know, and in, in fact, the smaller you make that top piece, the more shocking the finding is. Um, this is a very interesting um, picture, just quickly. This is what we call a heat map, um, the same countries I just showed you. And this is the, showing the joint distribution of income and wealth. Right, so that's it's across the bottom are the wealth quintiles, and across the vertical axis are the income quintiles. So if it adds up to 100, right? If if it adds up to 100, and the the deeper the color, the larger the number. Okay, so of course you do see this, you know, diagonal in the middle. So income and wealth are correlated, not perfectly, but they are correlated. So as an example, and in the U.S., not surprisingly, more highly correlated, um, but not by an enormous amount. But that number on the uh, in the northeast corner in the U.S., 12.2 says 12.2% of households in the U.S. are in the highest income quintile and the highest wealth quintile, uh, and that is relatively high across these countries. Okay. Um, I'm going to say just a little bit about this because David said a lot, and I think Avi has as well. Um, I had to sort of smile when you use that phrase, the usual suspects, because I, I probably have heard about 300 lectures in the last few years on... Uh, why inequality is rising in the countries in which it's rising. And everybody pretty much has the same slide. <laughs> so um, everybody pretty much has the same slide. Yes, uh, no, there's a group of kind of usual suspects. And, he, and here they are, um, again, David talked about this a lot, but obviously technology and globalization are two very big parts of the story of rising inequality, and they can't be separated. We think of them as sort of two bullet points, but they're really, obviously, they're, they're intertwined. Um, and then we have other things on the list here, changing household structure, especially the rise of one adult households, um, changes in the way high earners are compensated. That's definitely a big story uh, in many of the rich countries is this enormous increase in, in, in earnings related income at the top. That's been a big story in the US. Um, weakening protections for low earning workers, also a big story in the US, and reductions in redistributive policies that lessen market generated inequality. There are other things that one could put on the list here, but really the story that I want to say is um, some of these are transnational forces for the most part, the top two. The rest tend to be country specific. And as I read this literature and have read other, many, heard many other people reflect on this, I think the simple takeaway on the question of the causes of inequality is that they're, they, they're very country, they're country specific and they're time period specific. It's really a foolish, um, I hope it's not foolish to try to look at the whole list of causes. Uh, and I love your picture, David, where the whole kind of thing comes into a big blob of stuff. Um, but the fact of the matter is it is a fool's errand, I think, to either assign, to come up with a universal story um, or to try to apportion these causes that it's 10% globalization and 15% you know, reduction in redistribution, et cetera, et cetera, because they really do vary. And we know that by looking across, um, I mean, virtually every descriptive picture that I've shown you, um, you know, we, we could see uh, income inequality rose in Germany while it fell in France. It rose in Denmark while it fell in Finland, right? It rose in two countries in Latin America while it fell in other countries. So clearly, these are cases of countries that are exposed to relatively, sim relatively similar forces, globalization techno technology. Um, and so it's really a country-specific story for the most part. And I think that that's where, of course, where the policy analysis um, should lie. So let me just leave it at that. I should say, by the way, having studied the US for many, many years, the high levels of inequality are really no mystery. We have a very high level of earnings inequality in the US, and it really, I mean, it's a cliche to say that, but it's not rocket science to figure out the origins. We have, across the OECD countries, we have nearly the lowest minimum wage, the second to the lowest minimum wage relative to median. We have the lowest rate of collective agreements. Um, we have, with the way the boards are regulated, there's very, very little constraint on extraordinarily high pay uh, in, in, in the financial and other sectors. Um, earnings inequality is kind of overdetermined by, uh, by the way these so-called pre-distributive policies are organized. And the declining, uh, declining minimum wage has been very much associated with rising earnings inequality at the bottom. 
Um, the post-tax and transfer inequality also, we have a relatively, you know, we have a large welfare state, much of which is privatized. It's larger than people realize, but it's also quite regressive. Uh, and in terms of social assistance for children and for low-income households, uh, it has been cut uh, quite, uh, quite dramatically um, over the last decades. And so there's no great surprise as to where uh, the inequality patterns fall in the United States. So it's really a question of political will, I think, much more than, um, than a question of understanding uh, the technological instruments that would make a difference. So let me just, um, two quick things then. Um, this, this is important to note, and I, actually I put this slide in before I was thinking about Israel, but it's important for here as well. Um, in most high income countries where labor market, where income inequality is rising, there's a countervailing force that's in place almost everywhere, and that is women's rising attachment to the labor market. So there was some work that came out a few years ago, actually, by uh, sociologist Esping Anderson, um, who argued that women's rising attachment to the labor market in conjunction with assorted mating or homogamy was actually blowing up the income distribution across households. So they love to tell this story, you know, years ago the, the male surgeon married a nurse and now the male surgeon marries a female surgeon. Uh, years ago, you know, the male lawyer married a secretary and now the male lawyer marries another lawyer and uh, the income distribution is blowing up at the top. So I used to say, oh good, thanks, it's our fault. Um, <laughs> now it turned out, uh, I did find that line kind of annoying, but it turned out, that not being very scientific response, that it's actually not really correct, that the assorted of mating in fact is disequalizing, but women's rising attachment to the labor market is, first of all, sort of mating is not as high as people think it is, uh, typically. That, that it's much higher anecdotally than it is in any kind of uh, intra-household correlations. But also, that what's happening with rising women's labor force participation and their longer hours and closing the gap is it's pulling up the bottom much more than it's pushing up the top. OECD found the same paper by Susan Harkness in the book that I edited found the same. So in other words, women's employment is doing this, maybe pulling, and the assortative mating is doing that, but the whole story together is one of compression, okay? And I think that that's not out of line with what we've just learned in Israel as women's rising labor market um, uh, attachment. We're seeing it at the bottom. It's, it's part of the story of this quite dramatic downturn in household income inequality, so go for the ladies. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna end on this. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit at dinner last night and this morning, so I think I have like one more minute, right? Um, why do we care? Uh, it's often said to me, I know this is kind of stylized and generalized, that I, I'm in lots of meetings on inequality in Europe. Europeans often whisper in my ear, why do Americans always ask this question? Um, we don't ask this question in Europe. Like, what, what are you talking about? But I have to say it's true. People do ask it in the United States, and I would imagine it's asked in many places. Why do we care? Um, and, and we often say this is quite simplified, but many people would argue that inequality in a country like the United States, where it's risen so sharply and it's so high, it's too much on normative grounds. It's just not right. You know, It's not right in a decent society that the haves have that much more than the have-nots. Um, and that, I have to say, I'm persuaded by that. Uh, it has extremely little political traction, I'll tell you that, especially in the United States. I uh, think we're talking about human rights and social rights in relation uh, to the economy is not, uh, is not especially effective, and I say that as someone who spent many years in Washington. Um, so I think that now, partly, partly for strategic reasons, in my view, and partly because the research is piling up, the conversation is much more instrumental now, that inequality is a problem because it causes other things where we don't contest that those other things are worrisome. And the big story has been about economic growth. It is a very complicated literature. I think David had a nice take on it. I haven't worked in it directly, but I've read the literature. I think it is complicated. I think there are signs that inequality, um, there is a lot of research indicating that inequality is a drag on growth, but it really has to be disaggregated. There are a lot of caveats. It depends on where in the distribution the inequality falls. It depends on how the inequality is measured. Any kind of measure of inequality that's picking up on human capital inequality is indeed a drag on growth. It does seem that inequality at the bottom is a larger drag on growth. So um, I think one is at, uh, at their peril to, to mention the growth story without some nuance. Um, the other story that we are uh, focused on a lot in the US is the Great Gatsby Curve, which shows this cross-national scatter plot. Uh, a lot of that work is done by Miles Korak, who's my colleague in the Stone Center at CUNY. Uh, and that shows this um, upward sloping, this it shows a correlation between uh, country level inequality and country level mobility or immobility, which is measured by the intergenerational elasticity basically of parents to their, to their children. Um, the American dream rests on uh, the existence of intergenerational mobility. And if inequality is thwarting that, that gets people's attention. Um, finally, there's an argument, there are several arguments about social cohesion. The book, The Spirit Level, popularized that claim 
that inequality is bad for other kinds of things, incarceration, children's health, mental health, social cohesion. I think the, the empirics on that are out, um, but it's such a concerning story that we should take it very seriously. And finally, that it's corrosive of the democratic process, and we certainly see that in the United States, that there's all kinds of political science research indicating that money talks, and it really uh, talks a lot, and it has a big impact on uh, the policy mix. So on that, I'm gonna close. Thank you. Thank you.